So uh, when I was young, I was very ill from ages nine to 13. I had undiagnosed gallbladder disease, which does not sound like a big deal, but when disease goes untreated, it does go rogue. And this is usually a problem for alcoholic 60 year old men, not young people. And doctors would send my mother and I home from the emergency room time and again saying, there was nothing wrong with me, despite the fact that I had been profusely vomiting bile for hours on end. It was only when my bile ducts ruptured and the whites of my eyes turned green that the doctors took me seriously. When they finally opened me up, I was literally rotting on the inside. My experiences with illness taught me a powerful lesson that we can't just blindly follow systems that are already in place. We have to self-educate, self-motivate, and push beyond what is spoon-fed to us. For me, weight training was a key part of my recovery and it became a pathway to self-determination. In both my art and my personal life, I queer my knowledge of nutrition, physiology, and biomechanics to render through my body an expression of gender. I think of the body as a sculptural object, bashing through binaries and the notion that in order to be officially transgender, you have to have surgery or take hormones. I personally perform trans not as something about crossing from one sex to another, but rather as a continual process of becoming that embraces indeterminacy, spasm, and slipperiness. In each of my artworks, I train my body for different performative purposes, whether it's being pressed against ice, gaining 23 pounds of muscle, pummeling clay, or being lit ablaze. My live durational works and the resulting performative objects melt, flash, and burn with visceral intensity. Cuts a traditional sculpture was a six month durational performance in dialogue with Eleanor Anton's 1972 performance titled Carving a Traditional Sculpture. In this work, Anton crash dieted for 45 days and documented her, day, her body daily with photographs from four vantage points. In the title, Carving a Traditional Sculpture, Anton is taking this, this idea we have around finding the idealized body in a block of marble. And she's extending this notion to the sort of societal expectations that were placed on women's bodies. In my iteration, instead of the feminine act of wasting, I used my mastery of bodybuilding to gain 23 pounds of muscle over 23 weeks via regimen of force feeding the caloric intake of an 180 pound male athlete, grueling workouts, and six weeks out of the six months of taking steroids. And it calls to mind this amazing uh, quote by Susan Stryker, who wrote in 2008, so ahead of her time, I envision my body as a meeting point a node where the external lines of force and social determination thicken into meat and circulate as movement back into the world. So much that constitutes me, I did not choose, but now constituted, I feel myself in a place of agency. When I reached the peak of my conditioning on the 160th day of my performance, I collaborated with artist Robin Black She's also a makeup artist and a photographer, and together we staged this photograph, which we titled Advertisement Homage to Banglis, which is a homage to the original work by Linda Bagnus, which is now infamous, which was titled Advertisement. In 1974, Linda Banglis bought advertisement space in the back of Artform magazine, a respected art journal, which excluded the work at the time of many female artists. And placing this image in the advertisement section was a subversive tap on the glass ceiling that was placed on female artists' careers. My iteration was not about solely addressing sexism in the art world, but also transphobia and the policing of gender more generally. I was invited to make these two works, this whole body of work, Cuts a Traditional Sculpture by Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibitions here in Los Angeles. And they were doing an exhibition called Los Angeles Goes Live, the history of performance in Southern California from the 40s to the 70s. And I was invited as an emerging artist to look to their archive and to find inspiration as a jumping off point. And so I was thinking about Southern California as a locust of the feminist movement, um, various art movements like uh, Woman's House, which stemmed out of CalArts. And yet at the same time, 
just in Venice Beach, there's Gold's Gym occurring, this, this bizarre subculture of, of bodybuilding. So at the very time where women are trying to find a certain empowerment, there is this culture of just the inflation of the male physique. And I like to think of these two things in dialogue with each other. So for this work, I decided to undergo, as I said, this, this idea of bodybuilding. And for that, I seeked out the tutelage of the gentleman that you see on the top left. His name is Charles Glass. That's him back in the 70s. He was an original member of the Pumping Iron crew, which is why I wanted to seek his help. And this is him about 10 years ago when I trained with him. And to conduct this training, I went to the source as part of my research, uh, which is the Gold's Gym in Venice Beach, the mecca of bodybuilding. And there I underwent uh, about two sessions a week with Charles, the other two on my own. It was what I could afford. This is me performing a 650 pound leg press. And I've always considered myself really strong. I'm an athlete. I was picked up as a semi-pro boxer back in the early 2000s. And I found that I was someone who can always push myself. But working with Charles was a completely different level of push. And not only that, it was interesting because it really superseded the expectations of what I've, I thought even my own body could take. But in a way that was holistic because Charles was trained not only as a trainer, but he also had, in addition to a degree in exercise physiology, a degree in engineering. So he was really thinking of the mechanics and the machinery of the body. This is um, on the left, my nutritionist, I'll use quotes around that, Dave Kalick, AKA my steroid advisor. And one of the reasons I was so fascinated in this inquiry around bodybuilding versus just making a strict narrative around trans representation, words by the way, which didn't exist in 2011 as they do now, is because there is this conflation and this exaggeration of the physique. It's like a total construction of the body, a construction of identity. And it really begs the question when you dig into bodybuilding, this idea of what is natural? So I'm interested in this idea because precisely for this reason, because bodybuilding exaggerates the anatomy. Women's deltoids are the size of my head. Men are dwarfed in comparison to the size of their, their genitals are dwarfed in comparison to the size of their chests and necks. And then I was also interested in this idea of, of construction, right? Thinking about after the 1950s, the construction of biofemininity becomes a process of somatic political construction. In other words, I like to think of it as biodrag. It consists of a regression of molecular overcodification, a transformation of the structure of life, and a simple disguise or mask. So I'm claiming here from uh, Testo Junkies, which is a really fantastic book that was also written by Paul Preciado in 2011. I hadn't read it till a couple of years after I made cuts, but in reading it, there's so much interesting ideas that really resonate for me. The breast, for example, as Preciado writes, their weight, their form and consistency have required a plastic techno-somatic signifier in their production of gender. They have materialized as a new place for the pathology such as hypomastia, someone who's small breast syndrome or breast cancer, which appeared at the same time that techniques of mastectomy and breast reconstruction were being used, implants, incidences of which increased in exponentially at the same time in the 1960s as the H-bomb, the birth control pill, silicone implants. So the 20th century breast really functions not as a natural phenomenon, but moreover as a prothesis. Since the beginning of the 20th century, new synthetic materials, architectural structures, and the technique of artistic collage, such as film editing, have moved towards the domain of corporeal transformation. We've injected paraffin, gum arabic, rubber, cellulose, ivory, and various metals into the human body. The very first recipients of these rudimentary implants were Japanese female sex workers immediately following the war. Bodies would need to undergo a process of standardization that conformed to the heterosexual requirements of many American army for American army consumption. And then if we look to the very early techniques that were developed for treatment of what was called les gueules cassées, who were the veterans that came back from the First World War needing skin reconstruction uh, surgeries because of the effects of bombings and, and, and mass violence. 
It was invented for handling the victims of nuclear bombs, and it was transformed in the 1950s and 60s into cosmetic surgeries. And interestingly, Preciado points out in this book that in response to the threat inferred by Nazism and the racist rhetoric, which claims that racial or religious differences can be detected as anatomical signs, decircumcision, the artificial reconstruction of the foreskin, was actually the most practiced cosmetic surgery in the United States during that time. Which brings me to the work of the French artist Orlan, and this work in particular, The Reincarnation of Saint Orlan, a new project that started in the 1990s and involved a series of plastic surgeries through which the artist transformed herself into various elements from paintings and sculptures of women. Instead of condemning surgery, Orlan embraces it. Instead of rejecting the masculine, she incorporates it. And instead of limiting her identity, she defines it as nomadic, mutant, shifting, and differing. Orlan has stated, quote, my work is struggling against the innate, the extrable, the programmed nature and DNA, which is our direct rival as far as artistic representation is concerned, and God. My interest was also in the role of photography invented in the early part of the 19th century before the appearance and perfection of hormonal techniques signaled a crucial stage in the production of a new sexual subject and the invisibility of this truth so of course this process of representation began well before the, the 17th century, but this new photographic technology imbued things with a sort of uh, visual realism. And these are some photographs um, from classic images by Felix Nedar, and I'm going to read a description of the images he took of hermaphrodites, which are not here, but these images sort of suggest similar power paradigms. So the images representing hermaphrodites and inverts, a body named X in medical histories, appears in a supinine position with its legs spread, covered with a white slip that has been raised to the level of the chest, exposing the upper parts of the pelvis. The genitals have been unveiled to the eyes of the camera from a hand that comes down from inside the frame. The image reveals its own process of discursive production. These images share their codes of representation with pornography that appear at the same period a doctor's hand hides and exhibits the genitals, thus establishing the power relationship between subject and the object of representation. The face and especially the eyes of the patient have been effaced. The deviant cannot be the agent of his or her or their own representation. The truth of the sex takes on a nature of visual discourse, a process in which photography participates like an ontological catalyst, making explicitly a reality that wouldn't be able to emerge any other way. And so my daily photographic documentation is referencing both 1970s performance art, bodybuilding culture, but also the sordid history of photography as it collapses our assumptions about representation and truth. So like Antin, I took a photograph every day from four anatomical positions to document my transition. But my title, which differs from carving a traditional sculpture to cuts a traditional sculpture, is a twist on this idea of getting cut. And it queers the trans body by showcasing the cut of musculature, as opposed to the cut of a surgeon's knife. And these are the photographs that you can presently see on view at Gropius Bau as part of the Masculinities exhibition. And again, these photos are very large. Um, so they're, be able, they're meant to be able to be really uh, looked at, inspected. And those works are really meant to be in dialogue, both with the film that you saw, but also with this image, Homage to Benglis, which is not part of this exhibition. But it's an interesting, but I've also found that what's important and the reason why I made films like Fast Twitch, Slow Twitch and also that time-lapse series is because I wanted to show the process that goes into the superficial sort of glossy image that we are um, often presented with. And I was interested, like in Fast Twitch, Slow Twitch, in looking at all the forms of the indexical that go up to making that beautiful sleek veneer. This is a three channel um, document. It's totally raw and rough footage, even before the days of cell phone footage. So it's a really kind of crappy um, video. But I, throughout the process of six months, 
recorded every one of my workouts, every meal that I ate, and then the weekly or the monthly consumption of all the food that I consumed. So it was really a, an investigation into the indexical properties of what goes in to making such a physique. I was also inspired by Banglis's use of buying advertisement space in the backs of magazine to produce my own magazine and also uh, inspect and play with different forms of circulating the image uh, outside of the sort of uh, bastion of, of the ivory tower of museums. So I, I made this magazine called Lady Face Man Body that you could buy online. It was also had a website that you could go to. And I really formed these images through research at the One Archives, which is the largest LGBT archive in North America. And there, you know, actually it's an interest, unlike most archives, the ways in which the archive was, had most of its donations was during the AIDS crisis, uh, ashamed families, family members and parents dropping off their dead gay sons' um, archives, not knowing what else to do with them. But these particular images come from a sort of pre-AIDS uh, exploration into uh, self, self-transformation and also a sort of celebration of gay male sexuality. And so I was interested in looking at these pre-AIDS images, images that were very much informed by the physique culture mags of Bob Mitzer, and also thinking about Tom of Finland, of course, and Peter Berlin. People would buy the magazine and then post pictures of themselves, their faces erased, and instead putting the magazine in front of their faces. And here are some photos from that series. Trans years are kind of like dog years, and so much happens in a short amount of time. You know, 10 years is really not a very long time. But in terms of the discourse around trans, non binary, and gender non conforming representation, I feel like so much sophistication and articulation has taken place. Um, and so it's interesting to look back 10 years later at these works. In 2016 of May, uh, advertisement homage to Benglis was used as the key art for a poster exhibition at the Munster Museum, which featured homage to Benglis as its key image. And this image was censored uh, by the Deutsche Bahn um, for being, or actually, yeah, which was controlled by the German government, as you know, under the guise that it was considered shameful, quote, pornographic and sexist. And I imagine the reasons for this is that they had deduced that I was assigned female at birth and therefore my chiseled chest were in fact pornographic breasts. And so with this essentialist binary viewpoint, the poster was removed to protect the public from its shamefulness. And here are some images of some of the vandalized posters as they um, were found around the streets in, in um, Berlin and also later in Munster. Contrary to popular hysteria, which considers the presence of trans people to be a threat, gender non-conforming people, especially those of color, are extremely vulnerable to becoming victims of attack. And it is in this time that I see art as vital to the project of working against transphobia. And the recent attempts to ban my images, these and many other images that I've made from the public sphere, for me only underlines the necessity of these kinds of images. So I will end my presentation on this body of work with a quote from um, Paul Preciado, who you can tell that I admire very much. And it's also from this book, Testo Junkies. And they say, I do not want the female gender that was assigned to me at birth. Neither do I want the male gender that transsexual medicine can furnish and that the state will award me if I behave in the right way. I do not want any of it. Thank you very much. <laughs>